Of the many tragedies brought about by Canada's residential school system, the near decimation of Aboriginal languages counts among the most deliberate. To help reverse that legacy, real efforts are underway to teach and expand the use of those languages. And both technology and community have a part to play. To help explain how, we're joined by Mike Park Hill, founder of Save First, an organization dedicated to Aboriginal language revitalization. And Brent Tukane, CEO of Seven Generations Educational Institute. Welcome. Obuhu, did Buju. I Buju, Buju. Buju. which means welcome in Ojibwe. That's correct. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to ask you individual questions, and then we're going to talk about how you ended up collaborating together. All right. Mike, tell us about Say It First. What, do you, what is the mandate? Well, the mandate is to, uh, I've created a, uh, an idea I call in digitization. So it's digitizing indigenous content, but it's also serving it up in a way that it's being consumed by the, you know, if it's, if it's technology-based, the children, if it's paper-based, you know, it could be the, the adults. Mm -hmm. But I want to serve up the content in such a way that it's going to be consumed because we can have all the content in the world, and if no one's going to use it, it's just an archival piece. So our, our main goal is to revitalize the language, uh, to help the First Nation people that are concentrating their efforts on getting the language back uh, to support them in their efforts. Now, you used to be a director at Microsoft. Right. Why, how did you get involved in trying to revitalize Aboriginal languages? Well, I first started in, uh, well, with the government of Nunavut. Uh, we were modernizing the Inuktitut language, and I worked with a team of people there. Uh, we ended up modernizing about 860,000 words and phrases. People found that the language was being lost because it was no longer modernized, and they couldn't communicate modern thoughts. So something like uh, the internet, uh, the word for that is ikiakijut, which means my body stays here, but my soul travels other places to see. So they had to come up with 860,000 of those phrases in order like, for bulldozer, penicillin, uh, computer, internet, all those words didn't exist in the Inuktitut language. I wanted to talk more about those words in a little bit, but um, okay. first I wanted to talk to Brent. Um, what is Seven Generations Educational Institute? Uh, Seven Generations Education Institute is an educational entity that is uh, governed by the 10 First Nations in the Rainy River District. It's in the Treaty 3 area, Fort Francis, Kenora area. And uh, we've been around for about 30 something years mm -hmm. and uh, we service all of our communities uh, from kindergarten to post-secondary and, and graduate degrees as well. And we've we're into the trades, we're into cultural engagement training, we're into uh, all kinds of different things. And how did you and Mike um, end up collaborating together? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I guess it was probably about uh, five or six years ago <laughs> when uh, uh, through our partnership, Seven Generations partnership with the Rainier River District School Board, I was the superintendent there with the Indigenous Education Portfolio. and. Uh, through the tech department at uh, Rainy River District School Board, uh, a guy by the name of Stephen Danielson, he connected us because uh, he had, had met Mike previously and we just uh, kind of hit it off and um, you know, and it's history, <laughs> like it's, it's been a real, real exciting journey. And what do you, like what, Mike, what do you think you two can accomplish by working together that you couldn't do separately? Well, as I said earlier, my job is to support people trying to make a difference. My job, mm -hmm. see, I didn't lose anything by losing language because I'm non-native. Um, I didn't have to suffer in my lineage or be embarrassed about my lineage. Um, so I ended up bringing technology, a diverse background. I mean, we, uh, if, if Brent's team can bring the content and culture and history and I bring technology and and uh, I guess I've always been able to see things other people haven't seen. Uh, I block out the obvious for some reason and look at everything like a, like a child would look at, at a problem. And between the two of us, um, him being connected so much in the community, having a great staff, and myself not having um, any prior knowledge, uh, it really, I think, worked out well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, one of the things that's uh, uh, key with this relationship is um, Mike can bring 
you know, his talents and his connections to the table, I can do the same and we collaborate with them. That's, that's how this is working. It's not like just one specific thing. There's a, there's a bunch of variables that help uh, drive what we need to do. And we're talking about revitalizing Aboriginal languages. Um, what, I guess, what kind of factors would lead to a language becoming extinct? And this is for you, Brent. Well, there's, there's a number of factors. Obviously, uh, the residential school legacy is one. Uh, I mean, that was part of the mandate was to, you know, uh, rid, of, rid the, the First Nations people of their culture and language. And uh, so that's, that's a huge uh, factor. Another factor is uh, the elders that we have that are speakers. I mean, it's a race against time. You know, uh, as they're passing on, there's a language knowledge that goes with them that if it's not shared or not passed on, then, um, you know, it's, it's, it becomes more and more difficult. There's uh, three different things when you think of languages. There's preservation. So a lot of, uh, I'll get in trouble maybe, but a, a lot of the languages in British Columbia might only have, I, I mean, just two uh, months ago, um, an elder passed and he was the last speaker. Uh, some of them are down to under 10 speakers and they're into something called preservation. So they document, it's just for archival purposes. And then there's uh, like the Inuktitut language that's into promotion. So the language is still fairly strong. So they wanna promote it and get it used again. They haven't lost too much intergenerationally. And what we're worried about is uh, revitalization. So I, I focus in on languages that still have a critical mass of speakers. And uh, what, what number would that be? Um, I'd say f at least 500. It helps too if some of them know how to use a computer. Mm -hmm. um, then that number can shrink a bit. Like the Maliseet, there's about 350 speakers left. But I still work with a lot of people that use computers. So we can document. I mean, another thing that Brent never mentioned about language loss mm -hmm. is it's only been up till, uh, let's call it 1985. I mean, Maliseet didn't even have a writing style till uh, 2003. So it's just an oral language? It's an oral language, so it's never been written down. It's just been transferred orally. And now there's, uh, I guess in the, the National Archives, there's over 40,000 hours of indigenous languages being spoken, but they haven't been indexed, nor have they been translated or transcribed. Uh, they don't even know what languages they are, so it's, I don't know how they're It's really complicated. I don't know how they're gonna sort through that. Yeah. But the, I think the urgency is that once the people who speak it are gone, there's a likelihood that that language is gone with them. Well, it's not like German where you can go back to Germany and learn the language. Or go to Mexico to learn, yes, yeah, Right, yeah. and I also think it's important from a non-native perspective, I didn't understand the language, how important it was until a lady named Lena Evick up in Nunavut took me through mm -hmm. what it meant to her and it, it was her voice with the creator. So if they lose the language, they can no longer um, speak to their God. Uh, it was a gift from their creator. Um, and certain rites like funeral rites? or they... Funeral rites for sure. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very important. It also, because it hasn't been written or documented, it's been passed down like a bard system for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And all that knowledge that's been learned. I mean, these people, it's not just like they tell stories. They train for 20, 30 years to tell the stories accurately. So you can go from First Nation to First Nation to First Nation, and these people can tell the exact same story. All the details are the same. And this was the way they passed on traditional knowledge. So when their language goes... Um, tradition might go with it, The right? tradition goes with it. You know, in talking with Mike here, and he can attest to this, is as soon as you mention language on any First Nation community, it's like the ears go up and it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's really an important thing, the most important thing for them. And so I've, I've taken direction um, from our communities to try and meet, the, meet their needs. And, and it's been various initiatives. You know, we do, we do things in our institute like the Quest for Knowledge, which is a, like a reach for the top type of uh, contest. Mm -hmm. Everything's in the language and elders are there as judges. So little things like that to get people using the language more. And, and that's just a small example, but that's, that's, those are some things that are important. 
and we, because we live in a digital age, um, technology is important. What are some of the tools that are you're using to teach the languages? Can I show them this? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of tools, like, uh, you're going to use your phone? Excuse me. And what are you going to do with this? Yeah, before I do that, I, mm -hmm. I want to pass on a lady named Veronica Atwin mm -hmm. uh, was writing Maliseet in the 1950s, 56 years before they had a writing style. And she wrote it phonetically. Mm -hmm. So I just copied her style with her son's permission, and I've built that into the books. The first book we did was with Brent. It's actually uh, Brent the Moose. <laughs> and he's looking for That's his son. That's awesome, Sonny Brent. You have a book. <laughs> Sonny Ian's quite an accomplished hockey player. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, Brent the Moose is looking for his son Ian, and we did it with the phonetics. And uh, Brent had me present this at a language conference. And half the room, 300 people, half the room were just livid that it was actually written. And the other half were going, wow, that's kind of neat. Why would they be upset that it was written? Because it's an oral language, it's an oral tradition, it should never be written. But then I said, how do you read a book to your child? I could not find a single book written in Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, or uh, Ojibwe that a parent could read to their children. So that was one innovation. Uh, if you has, any, has that mindset um, changed at all when they see the books and within, this is a kind of a, a oral tradition now? Within 45 minutes of, I mean, the room just argued. I, my presentation was shot. <laughs> but uh, they just argued, and at the end, there was one dissident <laughs> and uh, 299 going, yeah, this is going to work. I can, I can read this to my child. That's not or, too bad. Off. <laughs> yeah. not... So I said, you know, it's the oral tradition. And they said, but it shouldn't be written like that. We might not speak it properly. And I said, the only alternative is you're going to speak like me because I'm uh, English only. And uh, I think the realization hit that, you know, unless we take chances and try to advance the, the issue, um, our language is going to have a certain death. And then technology, of course, very important. So I'm going to hold up this book, and you're going to do what? Yeah, so when I was up in the Rainy River District School Board, the, uh, uh, a team up there works with teachers to do augmentative uh, work to make things um, work better in a classroom, mm -hmm. and they do teacher training. They came up with this thing. It's a free application called Aurasma, A-U-R-A-S-M-A. Mm -hmm. So it looks for an aura. When it finds the aura, it launches a video. And I do all this stuff in the background. So if I just hold my phone up and pull it back. It works on an iPhone, an iPad, uh, any, pretty much any that cell phone. That is very phone. cool. So basically it scans everything that's in the book and puts it on the phone? Is that how it works? I create a video, mm -hmm. and I get an elder to record the video, and then I put it on the Erasmus server. And I also take a picture of the, the cover. So when the phone passes over the picture of the cover, the video launches on the phone. So now we can use the phonetics to read mm -hmm. uh, to the children. If you want to get help, you can use a, an elder speaking to coach you along on how to use the words properly. It's amazing the, the parents that have said, you know, these are all words I used to know when I was a child. You know, grandma or grandpa used to tell these stories and use these words and sounds. Mm -hmm. And I'd forgotten them, but I didn't realize that I'd forgotten them until I tried reading with the phonetic system that and is, then listening to the videos. That is amazing. Oh, thank you. Just so want to say that. Um, Brent, how uh, effective has Say It First been with your students? You know, First Nation students are no different than other students. Uh, they, they like iPads and iPhones and technology, and so you have to meet their, what they like to learn with. And so that's where we started talking, well, what are some things we can do, like, uh, you know, from videos to things like Erasmus to whatever. And, and the sky's kind of the limit. And the more we get people using the language, the better off the chances are that we're going to be able to have the Jibwe language continue on for years to come. Uh, it's, it, you're a ra it's a race against time, but it's also, you know, really important that uh, 
you know, there isn't a, a, a perception out there that we're just using this fancy technology to modernize the language. That's not, it, one of the things that we've stayed true to is the, the trueness of the language in terms of traditions and, and, you know, there's been, you know, arguments in meetings that Mike said over words and the meanings and things like that. But it's important that we, you know, that we're covering that and listening to the people that are, are helping support this. Well, I wanted to show you a video of an elder reading to two children in the Ojibwe language. Okay. Hey, bonjour. Nongob giga akin damin manzen na igan. Gaza win kaye inabi win ejunikate. Ma bi na bin neske bi na bin. Eka neske. Bonjour, Anin. Brent dish nekas nin. Moons. Brent the Moose. <laughs> Who was that uh, elder? That is uh, Coco Jones, Nancy Jones from Negagusamanakaning, First Nation. And I'm assuming there must be lots of challenges. We kind of touched on a little bit. What are some of the challenges that you face doing this kind of work? We had to take the book idea to ceremony, and it had to be accepted by the spirits. Um, then we had to convince people that it was the right thing to do. Uh, there's so many, yeah, I had to offer tobacco to ask Nancy's help. If I didn't offer tobacco, uh, then I'm breaking the tradition. And, you know, you look from an elder perspective, how is someone supposed to help our culture and our children learn the language if he's not even honoring our traditions? Um, I got an earful from Nancy before I offered her tobacco, though. Because well, now I, you remember, right? <laughs> because I wasn't going to, and she said, don't come back here till you offer me the tobacco first. She's been just great coaching me along the way, but I... I get it once in a while from her when I break tradition. I think she expects more out of me. <laughs> and how do you compete with um, English being everywhere, online, on television? Like, how do you uh, go around that? Well, that's... Oh, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> that's uh, part of the problem. UNESCO says one of the six key determinants of language vitality is uh, response to new media and digital uh, learning. Mm -hmm. um, because this has been an oral tradition. Everything we're doing, we're trying to digitize so we can kind of create the new base level, trying to make it available for iPhones, for, for TVs. I mean, uh, that film that you showed or that clip was filmed by Corporate Films Canada. They also produce a children's show uh, series with me called The Coco Jones Show. <laughs> I, it's funny, I actually got a grandson to take pictures of her. I uh, found well, there's only one native puppet maker in Canada. <laughs> and in Ganawagi, uh, just outside of Montreal. So we took pictures of Coco Jones and sent them along to the lady. She made a puppet. I think it's also important to, to understand that, you know, none of this would be possible without the partnerships with the Rainy River School Bo District School Board, uh, the Ministry of Education who helped uh, help helped with us in, in the initial years. And also probably the most important thing is, is with the communities. I mean, you know, we have uh, support from our First Nation communities, our leadership, and that, that is key because they're owning what is going on here. It's not just, you know, Mike and I sitting here talking mm -hmm. to you about it. They're, they're owning what is being done and helping drive what's being done. And that's really important. And to add to that, um, what value do you do you see being able to communicate Ojibwe outside of uh, the community? Well, uh, you know that that's a, that's a tough question. Um, you know, yes, there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know English is used, uh, you know, in chief and council meetings, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but I, I think the bigger picture is you know providing opportunities like. For example, the Rainy River School Board, um, it's important that they took the stand that they were going to back the Ojibwe language with French. So 
Students that wanted to take Ojibwe language didn't have to choose between if they took Ojibwe language, then they'd have to miss phys ed or art or something like that in order to take it. They backed it with French, so students have a choice. And Mike, why should people um, outside of the Aboriginal community care about this? Yeah, um, first off, you can, there's so many studies available and, and reputable academically approved studies or, or accredited studies. Uh, you can reduce suicide rates by learning the language at an early age because it builds self-identity. Uh, you can reduce uh, substance abuse. You can reduce school truancy. Um, all these great things about society that, that I always took for granted growing up are not available to First Nation communities without them uh, digging in and fighting uh, what's what's happened to them in the past. Uh, so, you know, they work. Um, and I hate the word they when I refer to First Nation people. Mm -hmm. But in this case, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, they, they want to do so, so well. They want a, uh, an equal chance to learn at school. Uh, so the education system needs to change uh, to cater to kinesthetic learners. And Rainy River District School Board's doing that quite well. It's not giving them remedial education, it's catering to their sweet spot for learning, which they've been robbed of. And is your goal to help people be able to access the Ojibwe language, not just Indigenous uh, students? Of course. Um, I worked with a library just recently. Um, I walked in with some books and said, here's some books. They said, well, this is great. We're trying to be inclusive. We're trying to be Aboriginal friendly. And I said, so do you know the seven sacred teachings? And uh, the librarian said, no. And I said, do you know the four sacred medicines? And she said, no. And I said, well, then you're not trying to be Aboriginal friendly. You're, you're Aboriginal tolerant. Mm -hmm. Until you actually learn some key components of their culture, they will never feel welcome in this building. And no matter what you do, you're never gonna attract the Aboriginal crowd. So they've started educating themselves at the library about the culture. Uh, they started a Let's Speak Ojibwe uh, program and unbelievable to me, they had about 50 people every week. Uh, about five were native and about 45 uh, people were non-native because the community wanted to That's learn right. more about the, uh, the, the native community that surrounded them. And do you hear it in the community or? Well, yeah, and just to add to what Mike said, you know, when, when the question is what, what can your non-Aboriginal people do to support this? And I, I don't know if it's so much what they can do. I think it's important to understand that we, we are, uh, part of the success of this is that the First Nation communities and elders are helping drive this. And so they have you know, it's ownership of it. And I think one of the things that's missed in the education system over the years was uh, a lot of our First Nation communities and, and Indigenous peoples weren't part of the solution, weren't part of what goes on in designing curriculum and things like that. It was always, uh, you know, this is what you're going to learn kind of thing. And so having our people be part of what's the learning systems are going to be and what's going to be taught is really important. So I think that's where the support, being open-minded and, and, and being able to, you know, we, there's a lot that, you know, people can learn from the First Nation communities and Indigenous people in Canada. It's, it's not just a... Uh, it's not a one-way so, street. It's not a one-way street, no. that's right. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's a famous quote out there, uh, one day give me one of your children and I will teach them what's good from our culture and vice versa. And, you know, that's, that's really what this is about. I mean, technology we're using to support the language and language is supporting the technology and, and we're moving forward with it. So I I think it's really important that you know and and you talk about the the TRC recommendations and Justice Sinclair and and all the work that happened there and there's a lot of things in that that can you know it's not just for indigenous people but it's for everyone to help support and and to make a better Canada and and you know I think that was the ultimate goal of Justice Sinclair to bring these things to light and 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 the 94 recommendations so uh, I think uh, there's a lot of things that are, 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 are 
moving things forward right now, and I think it's it's kind of like when you're hitting the hitting the uh, fire when it's hot kind of thing, you know. What gets lost when a language dies? Well, uh, basically, you know, you, the culture is gone. It's 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 uh, you know they're no longer uh, the people who they are. Their, their ancestors really don't exist anymore. Um, you know, I'm talking with some folks in, in our area, if the, if the language was lost, then you're just assimilated into the, the English language and there is no more culture. And, and uh, you know, that's a, that's a scary thought, you know, and I know, you know, talking earlier before, <laughs> before we were recording about the languages being lost every, I can't remember what you said, maybe every two days every, or something. Every like, two weeks. Every yeah. two weeks. Around so, the world, yeah. Around the world, and that's, that's scary, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, but I, I think I'm a, I'm a real optimist, and I always look at the glass, and it's, it's half full, and I think, you know, where we're going with this, the sky's the limit. I, I believe that we're going to be uh, helping support the languages on all our First Nation communities across Canada. You know, it's just there hasn't been those opportunities or there's always been some type of roadblock where we couldn't, couldn't overcome. But I think, you know, this is a method that's helping support. And there's other good things that are going on in Canada and in First Nations too. So, you know, one of the elders said, the more we're using the language and sharing things, the better off everybody's going to be. And, and that is true. And in a sense, it's like a, that oral tradition of passing it on to mm -hmm. as many people as you can. That's right. Right. And with technology, the sky's the limit. Yeah. It's permanent. It's permanent. <laughs> yeah. That's true, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> so watch what you put online. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> thank you very much, Mike, for being oh, here. thank you. Brent, you as well. Yeah, thank and you. I would love a Brent the Moose, please. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.